This is Deep Blue, where we get the true life stories of BYU athletes, coaches, and fans. Here's your host, Jerem Jordan. On today's show, I talk with one of BYU's best NFL players ever, 17 years in the league, had a locker room right next to a young Tom Brady, a man who played for the Cougars national championship team, and he even has perhaps the greatest nickname in BYU history. He is Thunderfoot Lee Johnson. What's up, Lee? <laughs> Oh, man. 17 years. It's 18, I think. Oh, it's 18. It? Come on. Get that intro right, brother. 18 years <laughs> 18 in the league. Years. Who's number two, by the way? Is it Ty Demmer, 14 years? Uh, probably Ty. Oh, no, Steve. Well, Steve, total professional years, counting USFL, is probably yeah. 16. Gotcha. But it's probably Ty after that. Yeah. 18 seasons. 18 seasons. And it's good to be here. Thank you, Jerem. It's great to have you here. You're one of my favorite people to talk to because wow. you always have a ton of energy. Ah. Did you always have this level of energy growing up? Probably yes. I've been told by my folks and uh, all the people that run into my folks, what is this guy all about? Is he this crazy all the time? So I guess I do. But I love it. I don't know. It's kind of natural. I, I probably, when I get around people, I feel like I, I kind of, it's how I feel most comfortable when I get around people is to be energetic. And But when I'm on my own with my wife, I'm, I'm a little more mellow. You chill? Yeah, I am. So I'm not really crazy at all times, but I do like to ramp it up a little <laughs> bit when people are around. I just like energy. Okay, let's talk about sort of your origin story. You're from Texas. Yeah. You end up at BYU. You play in the NFL. You work at BYU now. What's what's the start of your story, and how do you become Lee Johnson? Yeah, exactly. Well, I started out in Texas, Dallas, Texas, many, many, many years ago, and any and I loved playing soccer. I started playing soccer as a kid. My neighbor John Smith, of all names, um, most generic name. Yeah, I know, unbelievable. He is my <laughs> he was my buddy. He's a Four, five, six-year-old, we started playing soccer at a young age, and we played every single day, all day. And as time went on, I, I just was all about soccer. And when I became uh, oh, almost into my, well, my sophomore year in, in high school, I was just entering high school in Texas. You started as a sophomore. Um, my folks decided to move. They wanted to move to Houston. And I was super bummed out. It was an awful time in my life because all my buddies were Texans. All my buddies were soccer players. And I just wanted to play soccer, and I knew this would change my whole life because Dallas was a huge market for soccer. And I knew I was moving down south to Houston, and it was not at all anything like what I wanted or experienced. So it became a real a bit of friction for me and my dad. It was a terrible time in my life with my father mm. because uh, I knew he had to go, and yet I was just this selfish little bratty teenager who didn't want to go. But it's amazing how my entire career started because of this awful move to the Woodlands, Texas, just north of Houston as a sophomore in high school. So you get there, then what? I get there and I look for a soccer team to play for. We didn't have organized soccer in high school in Houston at the time. So I played on some club teams. And it wasn't until my junior year where a buddy that I had met was a football player about three games into the season of my junior year. This guy said, man, you got to come out and kick the ball. Because he had seen me kick around, I would always. Did you played football at all? No, didn't know Nothing. anything about it. Did, did not know anything before? about it. Didn't like football. Didn't like anything about it. no didn't soccer. Like football. Soccer players do not like football players. They don't like how they look. They don't like how they smell. They don't like how they <laughs> taste. Nothing about them. Taste. Yeah, well, that's pushing it a little bit. I know, but some people taste. Anyway, um, yeah. So. Yeah, they just talked me into going out. So I went out to practice one day. I was on the track team, and I was running track. And my buddy who was playing for the Woodlands, the McCullough Highlander, Highlanders, McCullough High School Highlanders, said, come check out, come kick a field goal, come on. And it's the middle of practice. They pull me off the track in my tennis shoes. I go to midfield. The whole team is around me, the coaches and everything, and I kick a 60-yard field goal. What? And Like off a tee? Off a tee. And I was completely shocked that Have I did it. you kicked before ever? No. You'd never kicked I'd a football. I played around kicking. I was always a soccer player. Okay. I had played around kicking footballs around with my buddies, but I never did anything anything organized. But I went out in this particular situation just to kick it for fun and I Why popped. are they giving you a sixty yarder? But just because initially because my guys told the coach, Hey, he can kick it a mile, he can do all these okay. amazing things. So I'm like, <laughs> Okay, I better deliver here. And I delivered. Wow. And I was shocked. I knew I had the strong leg, but I didn't realize I could pop it sixty yards through the uprights. So that was the anomaly wow. going through the uprights. What wasn't an anomaly was my, my strong leg. So anyway, the next day I get talked into playing football as a junior in high school. 
I had no idea how to put my uniform on, no idea where to put my shoulder pads, my knee pads, my thigh pads. I was a complete wreck because I didn't know anything about it. And I didn't realize, oh, you got to wear this helmet. Now all of a sudden I can't see very well. So things became very interesting very fast. But um, as a junior, I didn't play great. I had a strong leg. I'd kick touchbacks on kickoffs. I'd punt the ball well, but I could not make field goals. I, was, you know, I don't remember my stats, but they weren't great. Mm. But it wasn't until my senior year when BYU was playing – a and M in Rice Stadium in, in seventy nine in Houston in Houston. That's right. That Gary Zauner, the special teams coach for BYU, came and watched one of my games. Why did he go to your game? Because he had heard about this kid from Texas who was strong. He had a big big leg. He said, "Oh, he big missed all the field Texan. goals, but yeah. he's got a big leg." Yeah, big legged <laughs> Texan baby. So it's me. So he comes out to the game, and I just have an awful game, just terrible. I mean, I kick my touchbacks and do all these amazing things that a, that a high school guy could do, but. I believe I was 0 for 3 on field goals, and my punts were just okay. And Gary reports back to Lavelle, ah, this kid's not very good. This is the story of Gary. So, I, and I didn't even realize he was there. I had no idea there was a scout there. I just know I went to the game the next night, Saturday night, I believe it was, down at Rice Stadium. I went to the game. But I had no idea I was being scouted or being recruited or whatever. And I wasn't being recruited. I was being scouted. So the season goes on, and I just um, – I'm never really good. I never do anything great other than Lee Johnson has a strong leg. And I – because I wasn't fine-tuned. I was I was a youngster. I was a pup in the field of kicking a football. Are you still a soccer guy mentally? Are you making that transition? Yeah. I made – no, 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 I'm a soccer guy. Because you had defected soccer. to football. Yeah, sudden, it right? was a full defection, too. I let my guys down. <laughs> All my buddies. They couldn't believe like, it. like, you smell different. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, and taste different, so <laughs> – Anyway, it's um, yeah. So that's kind of what happened, how it all started. But I did not have a successful high school career. That's the reason why I didn't get any offers. I had no offers coming out of high school. No offers out of no high school offers. when you play eighteen years in the NFL. No. That's incredible. It was incredible. I went to Stephen F. Austin on a recruiting trip. Went to SMU back in the days of Craig James and uh, Eric Dickerson. How I much remember. did they offer to pay you? They didn't offer me. Pay me. Yeah, that's <laughs> how, how many knew. cars did they that's give you? That's how I knew that I wasn't. They were not interested in me. But Ron Meyer was a coach, and I remember going in there and thinking, oh, this is amazing, because they was the SMU. They were the team back then. L- little do you know what's going to happen. Oh, could you believe that? Yeah, you're right. <laughs> we'll I go mean, into that. Anyway. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's kind of how my, my high school years played out. Okay, so you you don't perform well in that game. Yeah. You take these trips. How does BYU actually come into the picture, or is it just you walking on? Are are there preferred walk-ons at yeah, this not, point? Yeah, at that time, there are no preferred walk-ons that I'm aware of. And here's where it gets really interesting because I, my, my dad went to BYU in the 50s. And he, was, uh, he went there for about a year and a half before he ended up going back east. And he said, look, just fly to BYU. I know a guy there, Jess Taylor. He was the business finance guy before Steve King many, many years ago, 72, 73, 75, whatever. And I think he retired in 79 or 80. I applied to BYU just as a student, thinking, oh, I'm going to go to BYU, maybe I'll walk on. I get denied enrollment. I did not take the ACT. I took the SAT. Back then, I think they required the ACT. So they denied me because of not taking the proper entrance exam, not because I'd hit, I had terrible grades, because I did, but because <laughs> I didn't take the proper entrance exam. But before the ink dried on the letter that I received denying my acceptance, I got another letter the next day saying, you have been accepted to BYU. We welcome you to come. And I'm thinking, what just happened? So I do a little digging, a little research, and I find out that this gentleman, Taylor, Brother Taylor, that Floyd Taylor, not Floyd Taylor, Floyd or Jess, one of the two. Both of them. Did something to help me get in. Jess Taylor was my dentist in Dallas. His brother was, I believe, Floyd Taylor, who was here. At BYU. There you go. And I think there was some interaction between the two that said, you got to get this kid in. He's got a big leg. Just get this guy into BYU. So within 24 hours, I went from being disappointed not going to BYU to being invited to BYU, and I was invited to walk on in 1980. You August were invited to walk on. So so you get into school, and they're like, hey, show up at tryouts? Yeah. No, no. This is pre. This is before. Okay, before. They invite me before. Gotcha. So I'm a preferred walk on. I guess I'd be I guess considered a preferred walk on at that time. They didn't call it that. But I was a preferred walk-on. I was one of 12 kickers that was on the roster at that time. They had, they 12 had a kickers? Massive, there were so many kickers. Now there's what, three, four? They had three and four max. And, and you give one a scholar, or one, one kicker, one punter a scholarship, yeah, right? Yeah. That's how it works yeah, today. Yeah, it does. So here's, that's the interesting thing because they did give a guy a scholarship. Mac Smith 
was my same year. He drives up in a a, a Trans Am. He's which, from California. Which SMU had given him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this kid was you know recruited by SC and some other nice schools. Yeah. And he's just uh, you know at the time I'm thinking, oh, this guy's just a privileged rich guy from California. He's got a Trans Am. It's the hottest car at the time. He's got the bird on the hood. I don't know if you remember nice. those. And I'm thinking, this guy, I just want to take this dude out. I'm going to show this guy who Thunderfoot's Not all about. Not out on the town. Yeah. Right, <laughs> right. But I didn't have the nickname Thunderfoot yet, but I, you know, I created in my own mind that I could outkick the guy. And sure enough, I did. This guy was okay. He wasn't a great player, but I was shocked that they'd given him a scholarship. <laughs> you don't have a relationship with Max yeah. Smith to this no, day? No, no. <laughs> no, we're not, we're not boy enough. Not a, not a great player. He wasn't very good for being a scholarship guy. I was disappointed. I'm yes. like, if that's all I got to do to be a scholarship guy, I've got two scholarships. And you're a Texan, so yeah. you're, you're like, hey, I'm coming here to do whatever we, I'm going to do. We got a little right? edge. Yeah. We got a little edge. Yeah. We got a chip on our shoulder. Got a guy from California. Don't mess with Texas is a slogan. No, there's a rivalry there. Yeah. They're really, yeah. To this day, Everything's I big think. in Texas, too. Yep. Yep. So you got the big leg of Johnson. So I come in, and uh, I quickly get to catch the eyes of the coaches. I'm just banging massive ball. I didn't realize, you know, I'm in Texas. I'm a sea level. And then you come up here to kick in a summertime in August, 105 degrees, and you're punting these balls. I'm like, oh, my gosh, this guy is Samson in the flesh. So I'm just banging balls that I was like, oh, my crap, I can't believe I did that. And it so, was again, little... you've shocked yourself. You did the 60-yard field goal. Yeah. Now you're again on a different field going, whoa. Yeah. Whole different world. Just banging it. So this is during the summer. This is during the summer, August. Pre-freshman year. Mm-hmm. You're trying to just make the team at this point? At this point, you're getting ready for trials. Yeah, yeah. The interesting thing is, I kicked, I sprained my ankle in late July, early August, before I come to the camp. I kicked the ground. You kicked the ground. Yeah, I kicked the ground. Field goal. Yeah, I'm with my dad out in in, uh, my old high school. I'm kicking, just warming up, getting myself ready to go, and I pound the ground so bad, and my my ankles ballooned up. So I come into camp injured, and I'm thinking, not great for a guy trying to make no, not a walk on with twelve guys and. And uh, so I somehow he Gary Zoner says, "Look, I keep I try to fight through it, right? I do all the things to try to fight through this whole thing. I'm like, Coach, I can't do it. I'm hurting. I'm a mess. So they give me two or three days off, and I start healing and start getting better. And then all of a sudden, thunder arrives, and I start bombing these balls. And just, wait, is this like your superhero mantra? Yeah, like th- thunder arrives, <laughs> like yeah. Mjolnir with yeah. Thor or something. You know exactly because you do the same thing. <laughs> I don't know what your mantra is, but thunder arrives." <laughs> I don't have a name for it, I guess. No. Well, yeah, and I didn't either until now. It feels, <laughs> it feels really good. So, anyway, it's – um, yeah, I just started doing some things with the football that I was even impressed with. I always had a big leg. But to hone it in and to, to make sense of the big leg is what I had to learn how to do. And Gary Zahner played – Harness the power. Yeah, you had to harness the power. Are you a lefty, right? I'm a lefty. Lefty leg. Yeah. 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 Righty, throw righty, th- kick lefty. But Gary Zana was so good. He taught me so much. He gave me the chance. He saw my leg, and I think he realized, man, this guy's got a chance. So he coached me up, and I ended up playing as a freshman. I beat all the guys out. Everyone I needed to beat out, I beat out. Beat I was Max the man. Beat Max Smith out. Beat Max Smith out. He gave out, you like his car. Drum. He ended up quitting. Yeah. But he um, probably kept the car for a minute. the guy before. quit. And yeah. I wanted his car when he quit, and he wouldn't give it to me. Yeah. Nowadays, that'd be an NLI. Yeah. Though, and then you'd get it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <coughs> hey, Max Smith, man, what's he doing now? He had a mustache, too, a dark black mustache. This is nineteen, the fall of 1980. This is right? 80, yeah, when you go yeah. wear a mustache. Okay, so you make the team. Mm, Are you like, team. You kn- did you know you'd make the team? You're like, no, no, no I'm going to make the team. Yeah, no, I it's knew. It's not a question. I knew. I knew. Clay Even Brown after was, you sprained your ankle. Yeah, I knew because I saw Clay Brown punt. I was impressed. People but forget I, that. Yeah. Clay Brown punted. Clay Brown punted. The great punted. tight end who catches the greatest play in BYU history, mm-hmm. the Hail Mary in the 1980 Miracle yeah. Bowl, we call it, at yeah. BYU. He was a punter. You're also forgetting, I think, and I, you'd have to check the date here, but I think he was All-American punter. I think so. Didn't or, he lead the country or yeah, something one year? Yeah, he did. His uh, his junior year, I think he led the nation. Was this 79? 79. So I think he yeah, came in. And then you in. show up in 80. Yeah, show up in 80. And I think he had a nice year in 80, but he didn't have the 79 year. Double check that. Are but, you are you splitting with him? No. Are you behind him? No. I'm, no, I'm, you're I'm getting the... no data. Nothing. They want no part of me. I'm a freshman. In I'm 80. a rookie in 80. Clay Brown's a guy. You're not going to mess with Clay Brown. Clay Brown's the guy. Yeah. Hunter. So, but we had we had the JV then. I don't even remember. We played. Yeah. We traveled as a JV team. So who did you was, play by the way? We played like, Utah State's kind of their JV. Played UNLV. I was going to say at yeah. that point, did you play the varsity? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Utah State. We, it was rumors. There were rumors. 
Jeremy, there were they rumors were bad, that then. yeah, when we got beat, whenever we got beat, we played the varsity. Yes, but UNLV, Utah State, Snow, Ricks, Ricks back in the day. Yeah, mm. we had some nice games. It was fun. What a great time. Andy Reid was coaching. Yeah, it was really cool. Great memories. But I did punt there and I kicked off there. And uh, but primarily as a freshman, I kicked off. Kurt Gunther was a field goal kicker. I kicked off. And um, Clay punted, and then the next year was the year that I wanted to play, but they ended up redshirting me because Gunther had another year, and, and Mike Meese. Remember, Mike Meese was a defensive back. He came and punted as a senior my junior, my excuse my sophomore year. Back in the day, you'd have position players kick. Yeah. Hunter the punter in the yeah. 90s even. Yeah, remember that, right? Yeah. Nowadays, it's very yeah. specialized. very specialized. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it is. When very... do you get a scholarship? After my – in between my, my freshman year, right there, I – Gary Zahner's going to San Diego State. He invites me to join him. Did you follow Tolner or something? Tell him to follow uh, Scoble. Doug Scoville, the Scoville. offensive coordinator. Yeah. Tolner ends up here, and then he goes there. Mm. Two but he follows Scoville down there. I'm, I'm going to go. Lavelle catches wind and brings me into his office, chewing on his tongue. Is that what Lavelle did? Uh, yeah. He always chewed that on was, his tongue. That was, a that was his yet. thing. Yeah. Some guys do it better than I do. But uh, <laughs> That's... Listen, on a podcast, that's the kind of audio you get here. <laughs> that's right. Tongue chewing. <laughs> You're not going to get this on TV. Come no. On. Lavelle's is epic. What a stud. Um, he brings me in his office. He's got his lemon drops, and he offers me a lemon drop. Wait, hold on. Does he always have lemon drops? Always has lemon drops. Okay, these are things I didn't know about yeah. Lavelle. Always had a jar of lemon drops. Gotcha. Yeah, Shirley would always fill them up. Nice. And he would sit you down, and immediately you sit down, and you just feel like you're at home with your dad. That was his gift. Lavelle was amazing. Yeah. And he said, listen, I'll uh, catch wind that year. <laughs> thinking about heading down to San Diego State. I go, Coach, I don't want to leave San Diego State. Oh, you're thinking of going? Oh, yeah. Because you want scholarship. a scholarship. Yeah. You're following a scholarship. Yeah. At least I'll make Lavelle think I'm going. Uh, In my mind, I'm thinking, I cannot do this. It's BYU, my dad, my buddies. You know, I've already forged great relationships that first season. You're hoping it's leverage. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't want to use leverage because I was fine. My dad had plenty of money to take care of me. And, but it's just you the just wanted, man. You want a scholarship. So anyway, Lavelle offered me a scholarship. And plus I had a very good year. He knew. Wait, he knew. did he do it in the moment? Like, he, mm, Yeah. Or was he like, well, okay, let me see if we can get some no, money. No, he did it in the moment. He oh, called me and no. It knowing. worked. Yeah. Yeah. He knew Thunder was coming in. <laughs> <laughs> he could sense it. Yeah, he did. There were some storm yeah, clouds was, rolling storm. in. Whatever, you better believe it. A Cat 5 coming. So he offers, I accept, and I'm locked in. But I'm disappointed because I didn't want a red shirt. So me and Jim Herman and Steve Young were all best friends. And Going into fall of 81. Going into fall of 81. So Herman and I red shirt, and I'm happy. But Steve doesn't because he is the backup to McMahon. Yep. That's the year he comes in, I think, yeah, Utah State game. So it was kind of a, you know what? I'm so happy I redshirted. I think every player should should play five years. Of course, nowadays everyone wants to be done and go pro as a junior or a sophomore or whatever. Right. COVID year, you can go six but, years. Yeah, my whole th- mindset was, look, i got five years to, to uh, graduate. What a great opportunity. So I took full advantage. I went down to 12 credits a semester, and it became Which really, is still a lot, by the way. It's okay, but, you know, full, full-time is 16, I believe. If you're a four-year student, you wanted 16. Right. Full-time technically is 12 credits, but if you're actually going to finish in four years yeah. and you never go spring, summer. Yeah. You got to beef it up. That's why beef I it. took five years. Yeah, did you? And I was, I was an academic yeah, walk on. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I took five years. I was like, I'm in no rush. No rush. Yeah. yeah. Why do I don't have be the, in a rush? I don't have the pressure of athletics. Like yeah. Is, though. Uh, you probably had other pressures, but man, school was great. College was great. The '80s were great, and the people that we had on that team. I go on the, uh, oh, what is that one? Uh, National Championship poster they have of all the players that played. You go through that, it's amazing how many guys we had. Of course, this last season with all the players we had go NFL was amazing as well. But so many guys in the 80s, in my class in 1980, Herman Sikahema, Young, Todd Shell, you know, all those guys. Like, wow, they, those guys all played pro. This is the golden era. We're hoping that we're entering another golden era. Here. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, it's going to be hard to beat 79 to 85. Remarkable. Honestly. It really I, is. I, I, it, in the modern era, there's no way it happens. Yeah. With the quarterbacks, yeah. specifically. Just the quarterbacks? I know. There's no way. No way. Although, in the Big 12, which we can talk about later, mm-hmm. maybe. You got a shot. You got a shot. Because if you keep lining up the quarterbacks, you yeah. got a shot. Yeah. 
It's a different ball game. Okay, so going in fall eighty one. Are you told you're redshirting already? Before the season, no, or is this like no, a revelation they, during they, the season? I think at the time when they when they offered me the scholarship, he maybe had mentioned. I knew that going into my sophomore year, it was going to be a redshirt year, early. You already knew this. Yeah. Okay. I knew early. Lavelle redshirted. Bronco didn't redshirt much. He, Lavelle redshirted everyone. Jim McMahon. Yeah. In seventy nine. Yeah. I mean, people forget that. Love the idea of redshirting. I think it's a great way. If you have talent that you like that you don't think you can get as a recruit as a freshman in high school, excuse me, as a as a senior in high school, redshirt the guy. Give him another year. So I, I'm a big fan of redshirting, which I think Kalani's doing more now. Things are so different now anyway. But, yeah, I redshirted. Herm redshirted. And, man, it began an iconic relationship with just all the guys. Super time. Okay, so when does uh, Thunderfoot – when do you get the nickname? The Thunder had it, always been yeah. kind of there, you're saying. Yeah. But when does it sort of crystallize into you this know, nickname? Who gives you the nickname Thunder? Yeah, it's on the – back then they had the magazine. Was it the BYU Sports Magazine? I'm on a front page, full pullout. It's not, it's not the front. It's I think like I'm the, on the poster? cover of Kicking. And then I think you open it up, and there you have me on a, on a double wide and this Thunderfoot. I want to say it's my junior year. I wish so it's I like could. BYU Sports Information? Yeah. It, it's a magazine we had. It's a, it was, uh, I thought it was called BYU Sports. It was the magazine that came out I used to weekly get this in the or 90s, whatever actually. it was. It was yeah, in yeah. the 80s. Yeah. And uh, someone had nicknamed me. I wish I had done more uh, diligence on around. that. We could figure it out. Yeah. But someone nicknamed me Thunderfoot. I think it was after one of my big games. I hit a bomb or something against Baylor, an 80-yarder. I don't remember. Eight, Wyoming. 83 or 84? Bro, it, this is eighty. This is eight, my eight. My junior year. So my sophomore year. My my, re, my year after my redshirt year. I only play my junior and senior year. Thunder lives my junior and senior year. Okay, so eighty three. So it had to be eighty three where Which I get the is name. One of the Thunder. best BYU teams ever. Phenomenal. We actually. Did I like this better in eighty three in a lot of ways. Okay, we did a show on BYU Sports Nation where we argued that maybe Spencer argued it stronger than me, but that eighty three might actually be better than eighty four. Based on the schedule. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it was an incredible team. Honestly, well, obviously those two are connected yeah. to many of the same players. Some would say 85, though. The Here, defense in 85. Well, yeah, there you go. I, I was going to say, if you lose three times, you're not in the greatest team conversation. Yeah. It's tough. Yeah. But in terms of just pure talent, yeah. amazing, right? Amazing. amazing. It really was. Yes. Jason Buck would make that case hard, at 85 team. Jason Buck still wanted BYU to go back, back to the Mountain West. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> The Buckster. <laughs> Luckily, we don't have to talk yeah, about that tape. Yeah, yeah, we won't. We won't go there. <laughs> love Jason. Love Jason. I love Jace. We so, played together. Since Thunder Saturday. shows up. So, do you immediately take to this nickname? You see that and go, love it. Oh, that's yeah, it. that's. The, that's I love lot. it. But one of the worst things about me, I'm not like Linehan. I'm not like <laughs> Old Droid. No one's like Johnny Linehan. I, 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 when, 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 when uh, Jake kicks a field goal, he gets excited and. Like flexes because he actually don't want has muscles. Any attention? I'm just. If I had the personality of Johnny and Jake, I probably would have been a 10, 15 year all pro. I never was the guy that wanted the ball. I didn't want the ball at the end of the game. I was a as nervous, a field goal kicker as as anything. I, I'm a nervous player. I'm not a natural. That shocks me. The biggest, given your sort of outgoing personality, listen, the biggest shock in my entire life, and I give myself full credit is that I don't like doing what I do, but I love doing what I do because it because I wanted to overcome it. Does mm. that make any you sense? You like the challenge of it? I, I love the challenge of it because I hated it so much. I loved to try to figure out a way to overcome it. And my 18th year with the Eagles, I'm out there in the NFC Championship game against the Buccaneers, and I get hit with a bolt of lightning. I'm like, wow, why couldn't I have felt like this? For 18 years. What was this? Peace. I see the ball. I don't hear the fans. I know where the ball's going. And it's like, oh, my gosh, this is incredible. So I finally arrive in my mind. I've become this player in my head. And then I, then the next year I can't get on a team. I'm thinking, do you realize what just happened? I just became a man. And now I can't get and you're on. You're how old? Thirty, late thirties. I'm forty. You're forty. I'm forty. In the NFL. I'm forty-two. Whoa, the original Tom Brady. Yeah. So, <laughs> and I arrive because physically I'm there. I mean, the, in the AFC Championship, NFC Championship game, it's NFC Championship game, it's twenty degrees. I'm kicking into the wind. I'm popping sixty yarders. Ooh. So it's not a physical thing at all. It's a mental thing. 
It, it, well, I mean, I've arrived mentally. Physically, I was always fine. Yes. I mean, 42 doesn't mean I could see why Tom Brady's playing because he's he's a quarterback. I was a kicker. You can do those things as a 42-year-old man. Yeah. But anyway, I don't know how we got into that, but yeah. You 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 got there. I finally felt like I got there. And I don't Were know. you disappointed after that? Where you were like, oh, mm-hmm. I just figured this out. Yeah, I was. Andy brought me back after that game against the Buccaneers. I was only on a one-year contract. And the next year they brought in a, a second-year player. Mm. And Andy invited me to the third preseason game. He said, come on in, LJ. Let's, let's kick you. Let's see how you do. So I come in. We play, uh, I don't know, whoever we play. I had a great game, three for 52. And he, at the end of the game, he says, look, I'm going to cut you. I want to keep this guy, see how he does. And I'll probably be calling you about game three. I said, Andy's great. Let's do it. Man, this guy would not have a bad game. Game six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I'm like, Andy, come on, baby. You're rooting for a yeah. poor punting day. You're yeah. like, shank it. <laughs> but I think they actually go to the Super Bowl that year. Did they go 03? They go far. They go deep. 05, they go to the... yeah, Maybe 05. Yeah, but they're 03. going to NFC Championship games. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So they have a anyway, stringer. that was the end. I knew it was the end. When I couldn't get on with Andy... I knew it was going to be tough to be a 42-year-old uh, guy, even though I was playing well. I was shocked hmm. that my season with Philly did not bring someone to the table that following year because hmm. I had a really good playoff picture with him. You're so like, You're like, Andy, let's just go back to these JV yeah. game days. Yeah, where, I know. That's amazing. Just I know. The, the tenure of that. Mm-hmm. It's like 25, 30 years. You know, it's just insane. That's crazy. Insane. Okay, so let's go back to we were talking about. You, you took a trip to SMU. Yeah. The 1980 – Holiday Bowl. You're a freshman. Mm-hmm. You're the kickoff guy in this game. Yeah. That that game. What do you what do you cherish and remember from that game? Because that's, I mean, that's the greatest play in BYU history. Yeah. It's the greatest comeback in BYU history. It's just unbelievable. unbelievable. There's no game now from that point to now where we go. Well, it's impossible. You know what I mean? Because that happened. Mm. I was so frightened. I was the kickoff guy. And as you know, as we got closer, that meant more onside kicks. Are and you I, good at onside kicks? I was at okay at onside kicks, but we had this onside kick we call the drag kick middle. It's not a, it, it's in the middle, right? It's a drag kick. I kind of top it. I kick it. Gary's honor. We had practiced it. Gary, we always, we both knew that that was our that was our go to. So if you go look at the film, the first drag kick middle, I kick it two yards, and my heel hits the ball. So they get the ball on the 50-yard line or the R40 yard line or whatever it is. Yeah. I was crushed. I was embarrassed. I was. It was awful. I think we had just scored. We were within 14 points or whatever. I don't remember the exact details. I just remember I flubbed the first drag kick middle onside kick. Well, somehow we get the ball back. We score. He calls another drag kick middle. I go, Gary, on the sidelines, Gary, do you want someone else to kick this? I don't know if I want to kick this. He got in my face, and I'm not going to tell you what he said. He said, basically, get your out there right now. Oh, oh, okay, coach. So we go out there, and I hit it. I was scared to death, but we hit it, and we we get the, we recovered. Did you recover it? I didn't recover it. My job was to kick it and kind of get in the way. Yeah. And, uh, Were you a good rebounder in basketball? Yeah. Box yeah. someone up? <laughs> <laughs> Throw up the elbows? I, I got to go back on film and see this, but I just remember being so frightened. But we got it. We took care of it. And uh, we went down to score. I would think we tried again. I don't remember if we tried the third time or not, but there were multiple onside kicks. And that was my role. As At that time, I was just the, the kickoff guy, and I was the guy to kick the onside kicks. I didn't want to do it. I, again, I didn't want any part of that. Just not my style. It was. It's what I don't like most about myself as a player, as an athlete. I admire those guys, the Jordans that want the ball. Even the the old droids and the Ricos, it's like I think, man, why can't I be that comfortable? Because they look so comfortable. Even Steve would say that. I think he admired Brett Favre and in those quarterbacks that could run around and jump and go crazy. And because Steve wasn't like that, I think he admired. He wished he could just let his hair down and be that free. But that wasn't his his way. Hmm. Just like it wasn't my way to to enjoy any moment of and, kicking. And in Steve's book, where he talks about. Having legit anxiety. Totally. Right? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, battling depression and whatnot. Big time. So that's <laughs> – we, 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 we treat athletes like robots a lot of time yeah. that don't have human emotion in those moments. It's like, listen, I know you practiced that a thousand times, but there's got to be a piece of you 
that's freaking out. Yeah. And I get nervous for the guys because you, you, you and I work at BYU and we get to know the team. You know the team even better than I do being in that same building. But I'm nervous for them because I know them. Yeah. And I know they're human. I know. And they, you know, they have the potential to do amazing things. They have the potential to fail as well. Mm. So when they triumph, it's really high, right? And when they don't, it's tough. Okay, so where are you when the Hail Mary is thrown? You're on the BYU sideline, but like, what do you remember where you are and what you're thinking when the ball's in the air, and then what happens in the celebration? Yeah, I, re- I remember very little about that because I continue to think my role. What do I have to do? What are they going to have me do? But I do remember seeing the ball launch in the air. I made sure I got myself right in the right spot at the end of the game where I was right by Lavelle because in a lot oh, of these pictures job. that we have now, <laughs> I'm like, who is this little kitty cat <laughs> standing in there trying to get all this PR pub? But you know what? I don't remember. I only remember feelings, just the moment and the elation and just, uh, wow, what just happened? Truly a miracle. Because I remember seeing the fans were just empty and just feeling sick inside that we dropped the ball. We were so, That game was – Dickerson and James, they tooled us the entire game. Yeah. And then the fans just gone, empty, the stadium gone. And then, wow, the comeback. It was just a miracle. It really was a miracle. It truly was a miracle. It's amazing. Okay, yeah. you play on. Okay, that team's incredible. Even your redshirt year, yeah, incredible. Yeah, uh, with Jim McMahon's senior year. Mm-hmm. Then Steve Young, you guys go eight and four. Steve, Young, it's like oh, it's good, but it's yeah. not what it yeah. was, right? Yeah. Seventy nine, almost undefeated. Eighty, one loss. Eighty one, two losses. Like now we're going right. 83 is sort of this uh, warm up to eighty. Or sorry, eighty two is this warm up to eighty three. One loss at Baylor. That's it. Finished seventh. Amazing Holiday Bowl game again. Um, and then Steve graduates, and Todd Shell goes first round of the Niners. And I don't know who this 84 team is. They're very talented, but who's this uh, Robbie Bosco cat? Yeah. And who's he that? Yeah. When did you realize, no, 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 we're really good, and we could do something special? Like, when did that set in for 1984? The biggest memory I have of 1984 is the first game against Pitt. When they're ranked third, I want to say they're third. It's live on ESPN. And live on this ESPN, and we knew we had a t- we knew we had a system, and we knew that we had returning players that were really really good. But we also realized we had a new quarterback. But everyone uh, knew Robbie was totally capable. But in the even despite the first couple of throws, yeah, it was awful. <laughs> yeah, I, t- I tell Robbie about it all the time. We watch Blaine's that game. going. I'm ready. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was. I know. I know. Like, but... Here, Blaine, you throw a pass. <laughs> don't go, don't make go back in. <laughs> Glenn's like, don't oh, think we dive so far. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. But we're in the pregame. Or excuse me, we're in the locker room. Before we're going out, we'd come, we'd gone pregame, came back in, and then right before we go out, Craig Garrick, one of our team captains, who's recently, he's not recently passed, but has passed away. Offensive lineman. Offensive lineman. Phenomenal leader. Great guy. Warrior. You know, played with just a blown out leg for forever but he made a comment in the locker room as we were going out that this was our season if Mm. we can beat these guys we were even talking about we run the table and we will become national champs wow so we knew you're unranked was our yeah i know wow you go from seventh at the end of 83 to unranked we knew we had just an opportunity to run the table if we could beat these guys and the confidence in that locker room was so powerful just everyone knew it was a great vibe and I think the biggest strength about our team was everyone was on the same page BYU teams have always been very we're so if you look at the talent on paper it's like okay one star two star okay one you know but as a group as a team we've always been able to do amazing things even the team we have now even the teams we've had in the past when we do so well I just think everyone buys in so well to one agenda and I think that's the strength of BYU is we always buy in. Everyone's on the same page. And then we were that kind of a team. I think we felt that in the locker room. At that that day, man, it was so amazing. Good grief. Yeah, Adam good Haysbert feeling. catches Adam, the game winner. Yeah, cause His brother is Dennis Haysbert. You probably know him. All state, state commercials. Yeah, yeah. President Palmer. Does does Dennis ever hang out? Does he I ever come to Provo and once, hang out? Never once. But we had no idea. But w- what, was he big then, though? No. I don't think no, he no, was. No, 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 no. He was nothing then, right? It was right? way later. Yeah. I was just yeah, wondering he if he came to see Adam. Or... 
It's like, yeah, Dennis Haysbert's my guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, there was no vibe there. <laughs> Nothing. No, Adam had the Adam swag at the, the time. Best. Yeah. Minister Habert, ha- Haysbert. Is he a minister now? I believe he's a pastor, yeah. He does something we in that. We got Dewey Gray. Dewey we Gray. got Irvin Lee doing ministry, I yeah. think, as well. I think Robert Parker does something. Remember Robert Parker I, running back? I met Robert Parker for the first time in person in Salt Lake this summer um, at a Wendy's. Came wow. up to me and said, hey, I'm Robert Parker. Love what you do. And I was like, you're Robert Parker? What's up, man? Yeah. So we like sat down and talked. What for a a while. He was great. Epic. He's doing some ministry. He is. That's Super great. Good. Super good guy. I love that. Love him. And there's been a gajillion bishops, you mm-hmm. know, in the in the church on the other end of that. So that's awesome. I love that. Okay, eighty four team just goes down in the record books, right? Amazing. Is yeah. that? Do you feel like that's the best team in BYU history? Do you feel like the eighty three might have been better? Do you feel like ninety six? Like, how do you feel? I'm assuming you think eighty three yeah. or eighty four. I want to say an eighty four. Those are top three to me. Yeah, 83, 84, 96 In I'm not sure exactly what order. I'm giving eighty four the number one. Though. Yeah, I would have to agree with you. Although I do think that there were better defenses. Sure. Maybe. Sides of the ball, yeah. 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 But, like, best team, how they performed with yeah. their schedule. Yeah. Could we have beaten anyone? Beaten or beat? Help me with that. Could we have beat anyone? What's the proper English beaten? there? Yeah. I don't know. I, 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 I'm, a com- I'm a broadcast major, yeah, bro. I know, but you should know <laughs> these things. We could have beat. Yeah, I think you think <laughs> I'm Greg Rubel. <laughs> could we? Have, have, have beaten, past participle. Could we have beaten? That's pretty good. I think we were pretty good. We were pretty good. We were complete as a team. We had That's the goal, right? Everything, every phase, and it's kind of like the team we have right now. The special teams are phenomenal. Defense, I think, is – well, after last week, I'm, I, I'm a little concerned. <laughs> that, that freaked me out, actually, last week. Yeah. I didn't get it for the life of me. But, no, I think 84 was solid. Oh, my gosh, yeah, I'm going to go with you. 84 was pretty special. And then 83 plays a much tougher schedule because in a- a- 84 – Pitt was a massive win. They end up going 3-7-1. Yeah, they yeah. don't turn out as good as we hope. Michigan was as high as number four early in the season when Jim Harbaugh's healthy. They had some nice wins. They end up 6-6. Six and six. That's a yeah. team that's a little more beatable at that point. Yeah. right? But you can only play the teams in front of you. Yeah. But when the dust settles, you can kind of be like, okay, whose schedule was harder? 83 schedule was way harder. Juicy. You guys beat UCLA at the Rose Bowl. They end up crushing number four Illinois in the Rose Bowl game. Air Force on the road. That was a top 10. Always line. tough. Uh, you know, top 25. Only two teams in BYU history have defeated uh, two top 25 teams at the en- in the final poll hmm. at the end of the year. Yeah. 83 is one of them. Was that really? I mean, I'm glad you have that data there. I, we were pretty good in 83. The schedule was harder. Yeah. And the 84 schedule is one of the five easiest schedules in BYU history. If you're going like opponent win mm-hmm. percentage and dot, dot, dot. But again. You don't choose who you pick. You just line up and play. Yeah. And at the time, they're number three. They're number X, Y, Z. The wax better yeah. at this point, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. You guys go undefeated. But is one loss 83 in the conversation? Hey, Spencer feels like that was a better team. Yeah, he does. Which yeah. is interesting. 96, they have to play 15 games. I got yeah. 14 and 1. I don't remember 96 very time. well. Was that, that was that was a team they just honored, Cotton correct? Bull. Yeah. Yep. Chad Lewis and Sarkees. Yep. Yeah, you're right. It was a special that, team, was a good too. team. Yeah. I would I would argue, frankly, like eighty was an incredible thing. They have one loss. It's funny and you McMahon say that. McMahon is the first quarterback to throw for four thousand yards in NCAA history. Yeah. Sets like seventy five NCAA records. I think Jim McMahon is the greatest college quarterback of all time. How about that? I think he's. I love Ty. I think Jim's number one, and yeah. then Ty is one B. Right, just there. like you could go Co, but if I have to pick one, yeah. I go Jim was the first to do it. Ty stood on his shoulders. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, no doubt Steve was the best overall quarterback. Yes, if we're talking pro career, no yeah. question. Yeah, McMahon yeah. was phenomenal. Ugh. What he did was Ugh. outrageous. Were you, you have around? a good Jim McMahon story? Were you in the 80s? Were you born? I was negative. Well, I was 83. Oh, was my born during heavens. the 83. Yeah. Oh, have mercy, See? please. That's terrible. Really? <laughs> you missed some great times. I did. I was just trying wow. to sleep and get You're fed like a at little puppy. I got a kittle. Today. Literally, but in human <laughs> form. <laughs> my my parents go to the 1984 Holiday Bowl. By the way, Do they, they really? don't take me because I'm a year and two months old. They left me at home, babysat. I I wish I would have gone to the. I could. Oh, I went to the game. It was great. I was one. <laughs> wow. I didn't go to the game. <laughs> I wanted to watch you. Uh, you know, punt. Oh man. You know. Okay, so do you have a good Jim McMahon story that you that you can share? Man, McMahon. <laughs> He wanted no part of me. 
The only story I have with McMahon. Well, he punted too a little bit, he, right? He punted with me, yeah, but I was a you freshman. Friends? He's big man. He's hanging out with all the dudes. He's going to Ogden on the weekend. Yeah, he's just hanging. <laughs> but the one thing he did was play racquetball with me one time. Okay. And I was so scared because I'm with Jim McMahon. And I you never don't ever think that the players aren't in awe of their teammates. They are. I mean, I'm sure there was players now. We were in awe of Zach Wilson, right? It's sure. We are. We're just like everyone else. And I was in awe of Jim McMahon because what this guy did on his own, just the things he would do are mind blowing. And then his presence in the locker room is intimidating. It's just one of those deals as a freshman, you're like, oh my gosh, this guy. But yeah, he comes in, I'm playing racquetball, I'm hitting on my own, and he pops in the door. Hey man, you wanna play? Yeah, yeah, let's go. You can't say no, right? No, you I can't say no. got to kiss the ring? Because I would play with Whittingham once in a while. Yeah. Kyle would come in, we'd play, pop it around. But McMahon, and uh, I was an okay racquetball player, but this dude's an athlete. McMahon impressed me because he was pop. He's power, strong, had big forehand, big backhand. So we played We played two or three games, and uh, he was super cool. That's the one thing I remember about McMahon was, wow, I'm a freshman I think I was a true freshman, yeah. I was, I was a freshman, yeah. And he was just really, really cool. And this is his best season, his yeah, junior, junior year. year. He's having the greatest passing yeah. season in the history of the world. Yeah. In college. He is. Man, that guy he was, was hanging so out good. With did he wear a headband? Because racquetball is a perfect yeah, place for did. a headband. He wore a headband. Nice. Yeah. No, he, he was said all, Roselle on he it? He was all dude out. <laughs> yeah. No, Pluto. Pluto. <laughs> yes, yes. He was all dude out, but he was a good guy. And even now when you see him, I saw him at uh, Danny's funeral. Danny Plater. Danny Plater, yeah. McMahon at BYU, you know, he had to do a little craziness to be crazy. In the NFL, he had, you know, what he did at BYU to be crazy, he wouldn't even move the needle in the NFL, and he had to do a little more in the NFL. But as far as what he did in the NFL and the leadership and the way he could build a team and everyone just rally around a dude, and yeah, he he got into some, you know, he did some dumb things. But even when I saw him, it's like, man, man, man's a cool guy. He's a cool dude. I like this guy. Seems like the best hang on the team. He's just a good dude. Just got to make sure you're still yeah. good to play the next week. And... Yeah. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> no one yeah. in the bushes. Watching. I like Jim. I like him. <laughs> we never hung out, but I like him. You played racquetball once with Jim? One time with McMahon. Yeah. Okay, tell me something I don't know about Steve Young. How was he as a teammate? I think he was a great teammate. He was very quiet. Um mm. What people that what I knew about Steve that I remember telling uh, who's a sports illustrator writer Peter King years ago I said to Peter Peter if you knew what I know about Steve you would absolutely die and he goes what do you mean what do you mean and I would never tell him and then finally came out with his book quite the tease yeah yeah he came out with a book and I was really in shock that he would come out with a book to expo- expose himself yeah it was great that was what I was leading to with Peter's like man you don't know what this guy goes through to to get ready for a game. You're talking with anxiety and depression. Anxiety, and that depression, kind of and just the battle. Mentally. The mental battle he goes through. And I I knew he had it, particularly Utah State, rooming up in uh, Sherwood Hills area. Man, this guy, he was, he truly, and he tells you the story, he was hoping the stadium would blow up, that he would never have to play. His anxiety spike level was outrageous. And the only time I ever saw it bigger was when he had to make a decision on the USFL or the NFL. Mm. After and, 83. And Cosell called. Howard Cosell called. And he was getting, it was just a terrible time for him. What's your decision? Yeah, yeah. He called him. And then actually when he got married, I've seen Steve deer in headlights really, really bad three times. Right before he got married, USFL, NFL, and uh, Utah State first start. So the dude is one of the most gifted guys. We would take classes together, and I realized just how smart he was when I knew the amount of time I put into a class and how little a time he put into a class and how I'd get a C and he'd get an A, and I realized, okay, this dude is very unique. Not only does he have a, some form of photographic memory, but his ability mm-hmm. to retain, his retention, his application, his way to look at something and make it work, it was a whole different level. And I realized, wow, I am an inferior human being in all areas. I have a nickname, but this guy's got me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm Thunder, but this guy is a wonder. He's he's Thunder in the classroom. Yeah, yeah, yeah gifted guy. But, you know, he just battled, and he was fun, but he was never really able to just let it all hang out and enjoy himself. I think he always was in the back of his head just this little anxiety button 
that was always there that didn't allow him to be. And mm. when I, I would get him, we'd catch him in moments when he could just let it all out. And he was a total riot, total blast. But it would always get checked because the next day was going to come. And the next day would bring something. I can't ima- imagine the pressure he was under. Yeah. From 82 to maybe this day. Yeah. I mean, he's on Monday Night Countdown. Mm-hmm. He's in Venture Capital. Like, yeah. There's always something. He's still competing. Everyone's still competing. Yeah. All of you guys still compete. It's interesting. Yeah. He's good now. He's so much different now. I think his uh, his ability to hop on a stage and, and carry a room is is one part of his gift. And and it um, it's almost where he is. You really see the true Steve, his ability to connect and relate. He, he's on stage. At home, I think he's a little more mellow and reserved and uncertain but on stage in the limelight, he is, man, he can go. There's no ball. better. And he's going. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you are, I think, the only punter drafted from BYU ever? Yeah. Or was someone else? Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure. Uh, Your fifth-round pick. Fifth round, fifth B, 5B. There were two picks. I was 5B to the Wellers. Are you like, nope, I'm going to be drafted, I'm, I'm good? I knew I'd be drafted. Nice. I had great There's workouts. not a ton of punters that get drafted. No. It's rare. My year I came out, there were some great punters. Dale Hatcher from Clemson. Mojusen- Ralph Mojusenko from Michigan State were the hosses. And I was always in a battle with those guys to lead the nation. So I think they had um, they were more refined than I was. I was stronger, but they were refined. Dale Hatcher was phenomenal. Great punter. So, I mean, I was intimidated by that guy. I punted with him in uh, the Blue-Gray senior game. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, is this my competition? He was so good. I was stronger, but he was a, just a machine. So, but I was drafted. He was drafted third round. Mojusenko, Mojusenko was drafted fourth. I was fifth. You were the third punter taken in the third draft. Third punter taken in the draft. Wow. In a 13-round draft. Right. So, very different now. Yeah. Right, seven rounds, and that'd be equal to a third round, probably. Yeah. So, it was uh, More teams like a kickoff. Those guys couldn't. I was a holder. Neither of those guys held either. So, and I was a backup field goal kicker. So well, there you go. I brought some edge. You end up playing 18 years in the NFL. So Oilers, Bengals, Patriots, Eagles. Did I miss one? Browns and Browns. Bills and Bills for a week. Hey, one week. <laughs> yeah. That's Vikings how it, and Vikings. Four games. Okay. Yeah. Don't forget I missed that. so many. Yeah, you did. Okay, so you you end up uh, doing a bunch of stuff that's awesome. Career long. What, 76-yarder, or what, did you have a longer one? In college or pro? Pro. I had a, my longest punt was against the Bengals when I was with the Patriots. And that was my against, punt. That, against the old team? It was a punt that put me in number one for all time. All-time punter in NFL history. By yards? By yards, yeah. So at the time, you're the greatest the punter by yardage. Yeah, by yards. In NFL history. Yeah, by yards. You needed teams that punted a lot. I did. <laughs> I did. You're right. I'm the most losingest player in the NFL history, too. Are you serious? Mm-hmm. Lost more games. Lee Johnson, biggest loser <laughs> here on the Deep Blue oh, Podcast. I've heard many times. Yeah. <laughs> in the Super Bowl, Super Bowl 23, you have a 63-yarder. Mm-hmm. That was the Super Bowl record at the time, right? Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, very cool. I was one of the Super Bowl supermen. They did a, hey. a 25-year Super Bowl, and I was me, Ray Guy, and one other you guy. You and Reggie Ray Roby, Guy. Who, I was one of the three that they voted for the Super Bowl supermen. Wow. I didn't win it though, but I was one of the guys. Great guys, the punting award yeah. each year. He's I had a nice Super Hall Bowl. Of Famer. Yeah, I had a really good Super Bowl. What was the Super Bowl like? Is that with the that Bengals? That was uh, Bengals against the Niners. Great game. One of the best Super Bowl games ever. And it was in Miami, and it was amazing. That's the John Candy in the stands, Joe Montana story? Yeah, I believe That's it that is. One, yeah. yeah, I bet it is. Yeah, I remember being on the pregame punting, and Christy Brinkley and Billy Joel, Donald Trump were right behind me. And I'm I, assuming you were looking at Christy, Christy Brinkley. Yeah, no, yeah. she was talking about me. I, I'd overheard her talking <laughs> to Billy about me, so it really messed me up. <laughs> I was so confused. Like my head, you're either super confident or super distracted. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe both. That was the most intimidating thing about that because, again, I did not like it. I, I wasn't a natural. I was so frightened in that game. Every mm. kick, every my opening kickoff, you know, I'm kicking 10 deep touchbacks. Are there flashes from the cameras? There's everything. In the stands? Oh, yeah. Oof. Yeah, the whole thing is just. Back when people had that? It's total stuff. sensory overload. It's just surreal. But it was, uh, yeah, I played really well. I had a good game, and we, man, they come back. We're, Almost had it. 
83 yards, is it? 83? Yeah, Johnson to Taylor, Montana Taylor. John Taylor came third, we know, man. So I had an NFL punt record punt, and guess what happened? An NFL record return. Oh. All in the same we play. We didn't talk net. Which is another record, two NFL records in the same play. For the Super Bowl. For the Super Bowl. Wow. But I'm beat. I think John's still there. But mine got beat by Seattle two years ago, three years ago. Mm. Whenever they were in the Super Bowl three years ago. Yeah, he beat me by a yard. I, don't, I, I don't, didn't even see it. I I was, I'm assuming you're referencing the Patriots, not one, not the uh, Broncos one? Yeah. God, I don't want to talk about it. Yeah. I'm a Seahawks fan. Yeah. It's still too soon. Man, yeah. <laughs> 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 Run the ball! Oh man! Yeah. Do you have a um, Do you have an experience from an NFL game or experiences that really stick out from? I mean, eighteen years, eighteen years on off the field. Obviously, being a locker mate of a young Tom Brady. Yeah. Was featured in the Dynasty with Jeff Benedict, which yeah. was fun. Yeah, yeah. Jeff interview, interviewed me on that. One of my great curses, and I don't know what happened to me, but I have zero recollection of anything. I I'm not. It's probably a great thing if things are bad, but when you really want to go back to memory bank, it is really eerie that I'm unable to to recall anything. I can recall feelings, but I can't recall events. Well, what were your feelings then? Uh, in some well, ways? I remember. I think the biggest, cra- the craziest thing. I remember striking with the Oilers. We struck, and I, I crossed the picket line, and I knew at that time I was in trouble because when the, I remember the feeling of just like I let my team down. And that was a that was a terrible time because I was an oiler. I was from Houston. My folks were there. I was Hometown. playing really good football. Then we strike, and I'm like, man, I'm a I'm a rookie or a, I think I'm a rookie or a second year player. And I'm like, I need cash, and they're talking all these crazy things. I say, I got to cross the picket line, and if you cross the picket line, you are an outcast. And mm-hmm. I made the mistake of crossing the picket line, and in so doing, the first game back, they ended up cutting me. And then I get the feeling. So let me take that back. So it was in my third year then. So I, I played two years in my third season. My third or fourth game is when I crossed the picket line. And uh, that was one of the memories I had of, man, I just I just cut a great career short. But then I got picked up. The Brownies picked me up and went there for a year and a half with Schottenheimer. And Schott- Marty was a great coach, but, man, he was a trip. And I in a Monday Night Football, Clarence for Dan takes one of my punts back for, for six, and I'm on the waiver wire the next day. I'm like, man, that's, that's what it takes. I don't want to be with you guys, the Browns. But so the, the real the real blessing was the, the Bengals. And I think the biggest memory I have there would just be the Super Bowl, coming in that year, my first year going to the Super Bowl. It was my first season, and it was a transition year for me because I was a barefooted punter. And going to the Bengals, I realized, if I'm going to make a career out of this, I've got to put my shoe back on. In so that division? In that division, yeah. Cold, cold and division. windy. Oh, and I realized that playing for the Browns that I had to make a decision. So I thought I was done. But they claimed me off the waiver wire because I could kick off, and they only claimed me to kick off. And then I put my shoe back on at about six weeks to work on my punting with a shoe, and I ended up beating the punter out. So I became the punter and the kickoff guy. And then went to the Super Bowl. So that was a massive time in my life of um, everything I was known for. Lee Johnson, Thunderfoot, Barefoot. Iconic, right? The only barefooted kicker in the league. So everything, your brand, and this is like, oh, now he's just a guy with a shoe on. And <laughs> I'm one was, of you now. <laughs> yeah. It's just I'm, I'm another guy. Because you were known as the Barefoot guy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah for why, sure. Why did you go Barefoot in the first Tony place? Tony Franklin, Russell Erslaven, A&M. Texas A&M kicker and the, the University of Texas punter. Back in the 70s, we're barefooted. So I saw him do it. Did you do it in high school? Uh-huh. No. I took it off before at, at BYU. BYU. Oh, before BYU? Yeah. Were they weirded out by that? Big time. I was weirded out by it, but I was hitting <laughs> bombs. I couldn't Just believe. watch the results. Yeah. Don't worry about the process. Watch the end game. The things I could do. I hit balls that would have blown your mind. When I was a junior in college, it was August. They had the scouts in, and it was in pregame practice. I was hitting balls that were so big, I think they were 80 yards regularly, five, five hang times. And I I was just, you know, thinking I was the man, and the scouts were blown away. But the balls were perfect. It was a nice broken-in ball. It was 105 degrees, no wind, and I'm punting down. At that time, it was a little downhill. The field was weird. We rolled the water off the – and 
I was like, I'm the best punter that ever walked the face of the earth. <laughs> and the scouts were, were thinking the same thing. <laughs> but, yeah, I wish I had better, better memory. I, I, I have some memories, but I was such a frightened player that I never could remember anything other than just being so afraid the whole time. Just locked into I love what you Mondays. Had to do. I loved Mondays because I didn't have to worry about the game. I loved after the game. I loved during the game when I'm playing well. But if I played poorly, then I was miserable for a week because I really wanted to be good. I wanted to be the best. I tried so hard to be the best. I, was, I took it so serious. There's great memories. Super Bowl, being cut. You know, being cut is awful. How many There's, times were you cut? Oilers cut me. Browns cut me. Bengals cut me. Bills cut me. Vikings cut me. Patriots cut me. Eagles just didn't resign me. Being cut is hard. The hardest was Cincinnati because I was iconic there. I had 13 years, oldest player. We were a terrible team. I speak out to a reporter. So you say, if I was a Bengals fan, I would sell my yeah. tickets too yeah. or something? Yeah. And then the team doesn't like that? Yeah, did, did not like it. They were just awful of me. It was never said like that, but the beat writer. Oh, how'd you say it? I'm in the stadium. I'm in my locker after the game, and everyone's left. We lose to Buffalo, and I'm, like, surrounded by the reporters. I'm thinking I'm the top dog. But I get what they're doing. I'm the oldest guy there. It's like the city's shutting out Bengals. So they're asking me all these questions. And the question was, if you're a fan, would you come to a game? And the answer was, you know what? If you're a fan, I could see frustration. It would be really hard to come to a game. Boom. That Johnson was it? Johnson speaks mind. So, so taken out of context. Yeah. Huh? I mean – yeah, Johnson speaks mind. Lee Johnson said if he was a fan, he wouldn't buy a ticket. But so that's not what you said. It's not what I said, but it was enough to where he could say that. Uh, context so, matters, though. I, being in this industry, it's like yeah. I never want to not accurately reflect what was said. Yeah, yeah, good point. Yeah, but Mike Brown, the owner, it, it was uh, you can't do that. Mike Brown loved me. Mike Brown was very good to me and my family. So it was I, I was crushed because my I knew Mike. I was really good friends with the Browns family. They, I'm a 13 year player. And I it was, all comes uh, crashing down. I was good to the community. I would suddenly. always go to all the events and do all the right things. And now I, I, I just am an ingratitude. Ingratitude. Uh, being ungrateful is not something I'd ever want to be known. To. I'm always grateful for any opportunity. Well, here I'm now this ungrateful, you know, bratty kicker. And you're so, the face of the disappointment, yeah, sort of. Yeah. You know, yeah. So thank goodness we're playing. Uh, I get picked up by the uh, Patriots, and the first game is. The Bengals, the following season. So I meet Mike Brown in the center field. Pre-game on the 50-yard line, Mike was always there walking around. He's there with all the owners, Mike, John Sawyer, and Paul Brown Jr., Katie Brown. They're walking around there in their top coats and their suits and their, their hats. And I said, Mike, can I talk to you for a second? And all the guys were there. And they all I knew them all. They're all the owners. We're, we're kind of like guys. And I said, Mike, I am so sorry. I, you know what I said I did not mean, and it was taken out of context. And he chuckled, and he laughed, and he said, look, I, I know what you mean. I knew what you meant to the program, but I had no choice, right? You can't. You got to do it. He had to cut me, and I understood it, but it was good that I was able to let him know that I had no uh, ill feelings. I was grateful for every opportunity that they gave me, so it was good. I needed that. Yeah. So you go to the Patriots, young Wide-eyed Tom Brady. Yeah, Tom Brady. Is next year locker. What what was he like? Man, he was a. It's so weird because you look at Tom Brady when I knew him and saw him, and you see what he's doing now, and it's like, where did that come from? And I learned a huge lesson that man, you can never tell what type of a player someone's going to be by their appearance, by the way they act, by their goofiness, by the way they dress, by the the way their hair, just anything. And this guy is this frumpy. Um, Michigan guy wearing these khaki, torn khaki pants and just kind of walking around, you know, unsure. But really kind, really kind and nice. And it just you think, wow, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. He's four-string quarterback. And he wasn't even getting much work in practice. He's a sixth-rounder. He's a sixth-rounder. You and probably was, cut that guy, you know what I mean? Most Typically. likely he would. He wasn't getting any action. Yeah. He wasn't um, – we had Drew. I think we had John Freeze. We had one other guy and then Tom, and then when, Bru when Drew went out, what blew me away right off the bat was, wow, they just went around these other guys, and they started Brady. And I'd seen him in the week going up to the game, and I'm thinking, wow, they're really, they see something in this guy. 
that I'm not seeing right now. But these guys are coaches. Bill Belichick, he's a master. They yep. see something. Yep. And he goes out in that game against the Chargers, and it was like, uh, wow, this guy's good. That was the game I got cut. I played really well, but I fumbled a snap, and Bill wasn't going to have it, so he cut me. One fumble. No, the year before, we were playing Buffalo in the final game in a blizzard, and I was holding for the kicker. It's a kick to win the game, and I fumble it. Slips through my hands in this blizzard. We win the game, but my fumble takes us into overtime, and it's minus 30 in a blizzard. We had got, we got to go to overtime. So we kick the field goal to win in overtime. I catch it this time, barely. This is Finn and Thierry this time? This is Adam. Yeah. And then so that was the last game of the season, and it rolls into the third game of that next year. And I think it just was a memory in Bill's mind. Bill's just had a great game. I finished with a 54-yarder. And um, I was it wasn't a performance. Every time I got cut, it was never performance-based. Houston was because I crossed the picket line. Cincinnati was uh, – Cleveland was because I got a punt return for a touchdown. You can blame me all you Is want. Is that your but it fault? Was, Cincinnati was being a dummy. And then New England was really probably Bill and, well, they cut me and they went end up winning out. <laughs> Brady won out that year, went to the Super Bowl that year. Do you so, think about that year? And like, yeah, ah. I do. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was totally fine as a player. I was a good punter. There was no – it wasn't a performance. I probably would have played another 10 years there. Who knows? Hmm. Just Bill was – Bill saw me as something that I wasn't. I'm a come early, stay late kind of player, and I'm a think about it all day player. I'm probably his kind of guy. But what did you say when you first saw me when I came in? What, what do you say about me? I'm always you're always energetic, energetic, yeah. hype, crazy. That wasn't Bill. So yeah. Bill saw Not the me Patriot as this, way. Yeah, he saw me as an energetic, crazy free-spirited guy who didn't give a lick about football. He's just – and that's how he saw me. But in reality, I'm his guy. But he didn't get to know me. He just saw me. So he saw what I was – what he thought I was, and but he didn't realize what I was. Mm. So I had a chance to run into him at Cape Cod four or five years ago on his break in July before the season started, and I ran into him on a bike path. He was riding his bike. And he had his headphones on, and he's a curmudgeon, Bill. You know, he doesn't talk to anyone. And I pull up next to him, and I go, Bill! And he looks at me, and I go, Bill! Lee Johnson! And you know, he's got that scowl. And he goes, oh, Lee! Once he realizes it's me, and we talk, and we chat, and I get a chance to just kind of say, Bill, you know what, you, you, don't, you don't know me. as You know, I didn't play 18 years because I'm some free-spirited knucklehead who doesn't care about anything. You wanted sort of to yeah. talk it out a little Yeah, bit. just like, hey, man, this is what you had. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I get what you did. You were fine. You're a Super Bowl. You won seven Super Bowls after you <laughs> yeah. got rid of me. You got no, you have no apology to me, but just wanted to make sure how for my he, sake. How did he take that? Yeah. Uh, I think he was like, he, he didn't say thank you. But he just, just said oh, okay. something like, yeah, you know, I always knew you were a great player. You had a great career. You did a lot of great things. And I remember after the game against Cincinnati that I referenced where I met Mike Brown in the midfield. You know, he actually brought me up as because uh, I in that game I set the record for the longest. Uh, had a great game. I averaged fifty yards, but I also set the record for the longest player in Super Bowl or in uh, NFL history. So we mentioned that Wait, you had played the most seasons most, or games, or most yards. Oh, the yards. That was the yards yes, game. Yes, yes, yes. And he came up and congratulated me for a great career, and so he was really cool. Really cool. Did you felt heard in that moment? Because it sounds like yeah, it feels like that's kind of what you wanted. Is. Yeah, I, I want think you I did. to just. I want to be heard. Here. Yeah. But as much as Bill could hear you. Gotcha. Bill's very unique. Yes. He's a curmudgeon. He's a media buzzkill. <laughs> but he's also... We're on to Cincinnati. Yeah, right. <laughs> I think he's a good guy, but he's he's just a, what you see is kind of what you get. I have, a, I have thoughts there. I think to be... And I don't know if this is a character flaw. It is a personality is a big thing to you, I guess. To be great, you have to be inept at certain areas. Yeah. Because you have to load up in this space yeah. and, and deoccupy this space. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like so maybe his thing is my personality, I'm gonna be a commander, whatever. Mm -hmm. But guess what? I'm just going all in on football or whatever. Yeah. It's interesting. It is. You and cannot I, have, to me, complete balance in mm -hmm. all areas and be great at anything. You know what? And I've used that with Kalani before. I'm like, if Kalani has a legacy of greatness, 
it will be the first in the history of this game to be that type of player, excuse me, that type of coach. He's very unique, right? Yes. He's he's not like a typical coach as far as he's engaging, he's fun, he's dynamic, he's he's just not a typical SEC, you know, he's yes. a, an amazing human being yes. who if he could be successful with that style, that is going to change the game and it's going to It's the hope cuz be, it's sort of the BYU way, right? It is. Which is Hey, we want to do it differently here. Yeah, we want to. We know that you know when when Bronco said football is fifth, people were like, "What?" Yeah, it's like let's be honest. In this community, it is. Yeah, we wish it was first. Yeah, but there's a religion tied to it, and there's a family mm-hmm. aspect, and there's a well-roundedness associated yeah. with this university yeah. and, and yeah. the church, right? So it's it's, it's interesting. It is. It's interesting. Kalani's very gifted. Okay, so good. there's another Lee Johnson on campus, by the way, who has a Ph.D. from Kansas State. Yeah. He's a teacher. Yeah. He's got the – okay, your standard email at BYU – I'm going to give this away – is first name underscore last name at BYU.edu. Mm-hmm. Okay? So now you can email whoever you want. Um, he has Lee underscore Johnson yeah. at BYU.edu. I know. You do not. We're not going to say what yours is so people don't just pepper you. I don't mind but if I do. do you ever get his yes. emails? Yes. <laughs> I get a text – what department is he in? He's in the uh, – he's a counselor. He's a therapist. Oh, boy. Like a real therapist. Oh, boy. Are you getting like, here's so my issues? He gets my emails. I never get his. But I got a text the other day, <laughs> less than a week ago, from a number talking about, hey, I had a good day today. I was able to do the things we talked about, and I was able to fight through, and I really feel like I'm feeling better. And you're like, that's amazing. You yeah, no. Good job. <laughs> and I'm saying, I'm sorry, who is this? And they said their name. And I go, I think you might be referring to the Lee Johnson on, on campus. I'm a different Lee Johnson. So somehow they've connected my name with my, my email. My, oh. my phone number's on my email. I'm shocked you've only had one text. Like yeah, this. only if had one text. That's it amazing. Was, it was amazing. But it's clearly it was a text from a, a patient or a, a patient, yeah, I guess you call him a patient. Or a student. Someone he's working uh, with. Yeah, someone, yeah. <coughs> or a student, sure. But yeah, that was uh, <laughs> so. I thought that was interesting. I also found that there is a high school kid who is a punter named Lee Johnson. Please tell me where. I can't remember. I'll have to look it up. But have you ever YouTube Lee Johnson punter? There's a video. Some dude created this. Really, he's a rocker. See if you can find it. He's a. Uh, I think he was a guy that played guitar, and it was a he died, and he was a heavy metal guitar guy. And for some reason, they use me and my my Madden football, mm-hmm. some of my Madden football stuff. And I wish I hope you can find it because Lee it, Johnson punter. Oh man, it's um in memory of Lee Johnson or something. It's out there. It's hilarious though, <laughs> because when it came up years and years ago, people thought I had died, <laughs> and they thought I was just this you know this rocker, this heavy metal rocker, but. If I can find it, I'll shoot it over. The to memory you. of Lee Johnson? No, is that you what see it is? anything? There's a three minute video. The memory of Lee Johnson. The man, the myth, the legend. Mediocre, washed up punter. Is that what it is? <laughs> and drummer for a mediocre me- is that uh, it? Metallica cover band. Rest in peace, Lee. November 27th, 1961 to August 29th, 2009. <laughs> it's your, these are your photos. Yeah. This is it. You see it? Isn't yes. Isn't that funny? What in the world? So I'm wondering if it was a. Uh... <laughs> Mediocre washed up butter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How about that? That's harsh. You're like, come on, man. But that is. Um, well, I'm sorry that you that. died in 2009. <laughs> no. Mm. I wish it was February 29th, so or February 30th, so bad. <laughs> Which is a made up right, day. <laughs> right. Oh man, I don't know who did it, but that that's was funny. funny. When it came up. People sent that to me. We're talking with the deceased Lee Johnson here yeah. on uh, the Deep Blue Podcast. Okay, you retire from the NFL. You end up finding your way back to BYU. Yeah. Is this your assistant uh, director uh, over athletic development? Mm-hmm. Is that your title? That is. What do you do for BYU? Chad Lewis, Robbie Bosco. What a, what a trio. What a great group. Yeah, Chad is our director of development at Direct- Brigham Young University. He- and you're the director of Hype. Yeah, I am. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> he runs a show for all things athletics on the fundraising side. Robbie and I are probably equals as far as our roles in being his assistant. Robbie's over the Cougar Club, Varsity Club, excuse me, over the Varsity Club. Greg Vihar runs all Cougar Club 
and Isaac Wood, our new guy, yep. helps Greg Love and also Isaac. is uh, he's wonderful. Does a great job. So we're all just uh, yeah, we're there to to build relationships with existing donors and find new guys and gals who want to come in and help the program. It's been a great job. Been there seven years. I never ever thought I would be a fundraiser. I'm never. I don't like being. I want people to take my call and answer my email. And unfortunately, in the world well, that which I'm email in, is it from? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Good point. Um, but yeah, in the role I'm in, you, you know, obviously you're a fundraiser. You're always you're asking, and you have your hand out, and you need help, and you you become to some probably kind of a pain in the butt. But as far as the relationships and the people you get to meet and just what you're around, oh, man, it's a pure 10. Great job. That's awesome. Yeah. Will the Big 12 change things uh, in this regard? Or yeah. will it be Will it be easier? Will it be better? Will it need to be bigger? The TV contract certainly will you know, double or triple yeah. the budget. Yeah. And so what does that mean? I don't see on the expense side of things, obviously expenses will go up. We'll probably have to hire more people to manage all that's going on, but we're already so first class in equipment. In and the black, travel. too, by the way. In the black. Who Everything we operates do, in the it's black phenomenal. in athletics. We just are so gifted. We do so much with not so little, but with less sure. than anyone. So when we get the cash infusion from the new TV contract, I think it's going to be a greater infusion than the amount of expenses. I don't know that, but what's going to help is we're going to get to reseed the marriage center, we're going to get to reseed receipt, all sorts of things. And I think that people love BYU. And when they see what's coming through the Marriott Center, when they see what's coming through Lavelle Edwards, and they want good tickets, our system is set up to where you join a certain level to get priority to get seats. So I think it's going to be a, a huge win across the board for BYU athletics and the exposure and the brand, the brand. I'm all about the brand. I love BYU, obviously, like you do. And I want this power brand for greatness, not only in athletics, but just in great people, great character and integrity. So, man, I think this is a great opportunity. I'm a little bummed we got to wait two years. but uh, It's a two-year engagement, which no BYU person is used to. Yeah. Is, <laughs> let's say it again. No BYU person is used to a two-year engagement. Yeah. <laughs> no, we don't know what that's like. We, we know what a two-year yeah. mission is like. I know. But we yeah, don't you know what feel it, how long two years is. Yeah, yeah. It's a long time. It's a but long it's going to come before you know it. And I just... Man, powerful. I'm pretty stoked. Okay, Ryan Rico, the punter. Yeah. Is um, he the best punter since you? He's better than me. You think he's better than he you? He is. I'm not even going to – he's not only better than me, he's considerably better than me. Really? Yeah. Tell me why. Well, you got, you got just sheer strength, the physical element. He is we, – we probably hit similar balls when I was that age – but what is so unique about Ryan is the ball he's hitting. I'm going to tell you something that you don't know and no one else knows except a kicker. The ball you throw in baseball, the ball you shoot in a basketball, and the ball you kick in a, a throw in a football is a special ball, right? They want their ball. Tom Brady went as far as you know, getting fined because he wants a ball. The ball Rico uses compared to the ball they use in the NFL is very different. If he hits a 60-yarder here, he's going to hit a 68-yarder in the NFL. It's it is, easier in the NFL. The ball is so awesome. The NFL football is juicy. You're saying the ball they punt with specifically. Because yeah, yeah. it is it's juicy, unique, it's right? Plump, People don't understand that. The ball they throw isn't the same as what they punt, right? Well, in the NFL, it's the same. Well, I mean, like, it's uh, in maybe college, broken in differently or something? Yeah. In college, the ones that I know, the quarterback ball is the kickers in college – can, if they want, use a different ball. Mm. At BYU, Rico kicks the, the quarterback ball, as oh. far as I know. Okay. I'm pretty sure, unless I'm tripping. But I've seen the ball he kicks, and I've seen the ball the NFL uses. Very different. So just strength, a 60-yard punt, is going to go higher and farther in the NFL from the NFL ball. But the special thing about Rico is in the NFL, it's not about how far you can kick a field goal. It's not about how far you can punt. It's about how Few bad punts, how few mm. kicks you miss, that's what they want. Because most guys are going to kick a 50-yard field goal, 55-yard field goal, but they don't want you missing 38s and 36s. So Rico doesn't hit bad balls. I was going to say, has he had a bad punt yet at BYU? You know, he's had punts that didn't turn over, but his bad punt is still a really good punt. 
And I watch him every day from my window practice and pre-practice. He's punting. He probably punts, let's say, 30 balls. The entire time I'm like, who is this dude? And if I played 18 years, this guy's got to be an 18-year Pro Bowl guy. Wow. I, I just don't see – there's nothing that he does. I know he's in altitude. I know he's whatever. You know, but it doesn't matter. I mean, it matters if you're going to hit 65, it's going to go 75. But he is, he's really, really gifted. Not only is he a good dude, he's huge. He's 6'4", probably 230. When I look at him, I'm like, I got to go home. Hey there. Hey, Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm embarrassed. <laughs> but he's just good. He catches the ball. His style, mm-hmm. his two-step, his mechanics, all these things that these coaches are just – he's solid across the board. He There's no weakness. That's quite the statement you're making here. Well, his um, inside his pooch punts. He knows how to kick a rugby pooch punt. He did that the other day. Johnny Linehan's like, 50, get off my lawn. His inside the 50 punts are perfect. Then he hits bombs. Okay, he has an 83-yarder against Gold, Arizona State. Yeah. That is the longest punt in BYU history. I, I assume you had the longest punt for a while, and then Scott Arlano had like an 81-yarder mm-hmm. in Middle Tennessee in uh, 2014, and then we saw the longest punt in BYU history. Which, by the way, it was like 68 yards in the air or something. Where he had another one that was a touchback that was like, yeah, just insane. Every time he punts, it's must see. Yeah, this year, which is incredible. He's amazing. I I know so, someone told me on the team. Listen, we don't we don't want to pub him too much because we want him to be here next year. Yeah, <laughs> he could go pro. Yeah, right. But um, no, he. He uh, he is so good. They love him and want him to be here for a couple of years. But he yeah. might he might be a go early punter. Yeah, who knows? He will. He can, but there's nothing wrong with sticking around. Get your degree. You're going to be great. You're going to be great as a junior. Great as a senior. Uh, you know what? It's, it's he's you technically take a second year freshman because of COVID. Yeah, I don't know what their league requires. I don't know if they allow you to go out as a well three years from high school. So he'd be three anyway, years. Anyway, yeah, no matter mission or not. He went on a mission. Yeah, so he'd qualify. He could go. He could have gone after last yeah. year, I think. He's a he's the guy from San Diego State's got some more punts. I don't know what his situation is, but Rico. You know what? I was thinking he was going to beat beat my single game record the other night. You know, I've got the single game record for sixty point, whatever it is, sixty point two. Jeremy, you didn't do your research, buddy. No, no, I, I did not do the. I got the NCAA research. record for the. Best average in a game. Mm. I can't. I'm not. I can't tell you this. You should know this stuff. I don't. I'm again. I'm not Gregor. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so he was on track to beat that thing. Then he had that pooch. He had to pooch at the end of the game. Yeah. But uh, where am I going with this? I forgot where I'm going. With I don't even other care. Than I love every second of this. He's uh, he's just he's so good. He's so good. And I tell him he's good, but. I don't want to tell him too much because right. you don't want to. I always hated that. Don't tell him too much; you'll get a big head. Look, when you're good, you're good. When you're and good, and if you're, you're really good. good, you don't mind being told because you already know. Yes, yes. And he knows, and he likes to lift, and he likes to show his muscles. Yes, so he does. Clearly, he's like Jake Oldroyd. He likes to show his muscles. Both those guys. And there's man. another guy that could be an NFL guy. Yes, I feel really badly that we got to we got to get trials. Jake. Yep, yeah. we got to get Jake uh, in the game. You know. Yeah. Yep. Well, Leah, this has been awesome, man. So I'm, fun. I'm really sorry you don't have the uh, straight up email at BYU because you were the second Lee Johnson. I'm yeah. really sorry you died in 2009. Yeah, two terrible <laughs> things. <laughs> <laughs> but what a what a career and what a life you've had. It's been awesome, um, and it's it's always good to see you. You always bring the juice. Thank and, you, brother. Uh, thank you for hanging out with me for this edition of Deep Blue, man. Super. Thank you so much. It's been a great time. Okay, that'll do it for us. Listen to previous episodes on the BYU Radio app, where podcasts are found for. Thunderfoot, Lee Johnson, producers Trent Rhymeschusel and Tanner Graff. I'm Jerem Jordan. You've just listened to Deep Blue on BYU Radio.